Hey there, it's Carmen Sanyovi from Top Flight Family. And today's video is all about elevation sickness or altitude sickness and tips on how to avoid getting it uh, if you are going to a destination where um, the elevation is pretty high. So in case you are not familiar with my channel, Top Flight Family is a channel where uh, I basically document the travels of me and my family. So it's me, my husband, Serge, um, our nine-year-old daughter, Sean, and our six-year-old daughter, Ella. And um, this, uh, I guess this particular video is part of a regular series of live videos that I do in which I share um, different travel tips for families who are looking to travel more, um, but do so in comfort and style and are just looking for ways to make it easier. Um, so please forgive the dorky uh, microphone here. Uh, I don't have a <laughs> microphone stand yet. Uh, at some point I'll have that set up, but for now I'm holding it as if I am a talk show host. But hopefully this will at least give you better audio than some of my past live videos. Okay, so let's get started with um, talking about what exactly is altitude sickness or what are the symptoms? How do you know if you have it? Um, so some of the typical symptoms are having a headache, feeling nauseous, feeling fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, trouble sleeping. You might feel short of breath. Um, your heart might beat really fast. And let me actually pause here and kind of explain why I decided to do a video on this. Um, so my family and I um, were in Keystone, Colorado for a ski trip uh, just this past December. And yes, we are putting together the travel vlog from that and hopefully that'll be up on the channel shortly. Um, but, uh, you know, this was our second ski trip and it's our second time to skiing in Colorado also specifically. Um, last year we were in Beaver Creek and we felt, we didn't feel it that much. Um, I feel like there were a few moments where um, when we had first gone from indoors to outdoors and we were walking and then Serge and I were like, whoa, we're like a little out of breath here. Um, but other than that, we didn't really notice too many symptoms when it came to elevation sickness or altitude sickness. Um, however, on this trip to Keystone, it was a big difference. And it's interesting because the um, altitude difference between the two destinations is not even that big. So Beaver Creek is at 8,000 feet. Um, Keystone is at 9,000 feet, but those 1,000 feet were like night and day for us in terms of how it made us feel. And so um, I, I think we were all really taken aback by how much it impacted us. So I thought I would put together this video to kind of share some tips so that you can be prepared if you're doing a Colorado ski trip or really most ski trips are gonna be at a high elevation. Um, you wanna kind of be prepared for what you might experience and what your family might experience. So who is vulnerable to elevation sickness? Um, unfortunately, everyone is. <laughs> so um, it's not something that discriminates by age, by gender, even fitness level. Um, even if you're super fit um, compared to someone who is less fit, you could still get these symptoms. So unfortunately, it's something that anyone can really come down with. Um, so what causes altitude sickness? So one of the common myths, and actually this is something that I assumed before I started researching <laughs> some facts for this video, um, what you often hear is that there is less oxygen uh, up at higher altitudes. So that's not really technically true. Um, actually, whether you're at sea level or at a high elevation, um, typically there's always the same amount of oxygen in the air. It's usually around 21%. Um, what changes, though, if uh, when you're at a high elevation is that um, the number of, I'm, I'm referring to my notes here, the number of oxygen molecules per breath decreases. So you're less able to access the oxygen when you're breathing, and that's because the air pressure is different. Um, so um, let's see. Okay, so yeah, this one interesting fact that I found is if you go up to really high levels, like if you're, you know, a mountain climber going up Everest or some other huge mountain like that, at about 18,000 feet above sea level, your each breath will contain approximately half of the oxygen found at sea level. So it can really make a big difference in terms of how your body functions because you have to breathe faster to compensate for the less the, the lack of oxygen that you're getting. Your heart has to beat faster also. And um, 
even though breathing faster will raise your blood oxygen levels, it still may not reach the same levels or concentrations as at sea level. So it really all has to do with air pressure and how your body is able to access the oxygen that's in the air. Not that there's less oxygen, um, it's really how your body can access it. All right, so with all of that out of the way, um, let's talk about um, when, at what point can altitude sickness kick in? Um, so typically, most human beings will um, start experiencing symptoms of altitude sickness once you get to elevations of between 7,500 to 8,000 feet. So that is definitely in line with our experience, right? So in Beaver Creek, um, Colorado, where we were last year, that was about 8,000 feet and we felt a little bit of it. Um, and then you added another thousand feet and it was like, whoa, you know, now we're really, really feeling it. So um, let's get into the tips for how to actually avoid altitude sickness or elevation sickness, because there are some things you can do to either prevent it or to greatly lessen the impact that you're going to feel. So the first thing is, um, the the way that you're going to be hit hardest by elevation sickness is if you go straight from sea level to the high level and um in other words like um you know our trip to keystone let's say we flew directly from new york into and there's no airport there as far as i know maybe like a, if you have a private plane or something but let's imagine that there was an airport right at Keystone uh, Resort. And we flew from New York straight into the airport at Keystone. So we're going from sea level to 9,000 feet. Then that's when it would really hit you really, really, really badly. So the more that you can kind of slow down your approach to the elevation, um, the better your body is going to handle it. Um, so just to give you an example, um, one thing that you can do and that you can consider doing when you're planning um, a trip is to actually spend a day or two at a destination that is at kind of a midway point or a moderate elevation level before you go to the high one. So just sticking to the Colorado um, example, since it's kind of the area that I know best, <laughs> um, if you were to fly into Denver which is at about five to 6,000 feet. Um, and if you spend a day or two there, and then you go on to the mountain, which may be at eight or 9,000 feet, you're going to actually feel a lot better than if you go straight to the mountain. So for us, we weren't necessarily able to spend a night or two in Denver. However, we did fly into Denver. And then from there, we um, drove up to the mountain and it was about a two and a half hour drive. So even that made a difference for us, I think. Um, I think if we had, um, you know, kind of shown up <laughs> in Keystone um, right away from New York, it would have been a huge difference. But the fact that we got into Denver, which is at kind of a moderate elevation, and then we were able to drive and spend those two and a half hours allowing our bodies to acclimate, um, that made a difference. But ideally, if you can spend a night or two there, um, that's even better. Um, so tip number two is, sorry, my alarm. Um, tip number two is um, once you get to the high elevation, if at all possible, try not to do anything active for the first 24 hours. So the first 24 hours is when your body is gonna have the hardest time because it's doing all the work to adjust to this new elevation. And so if you can take it as easy as possible, that's ideal. So basically you don't necessarily wanna like show up to Keystone and then start skiing right away that's not going to be the best for your body. Um, so if you can spend that first day just chilling, going to the spa, relaxing in the hot tub, just generally taking it easy as your body acclimates, you'll probably have a better experience overall. Again, unfortunately, this is not something we were really able to do. Um, we did manage to hold off on skiing until the following morning. Uh, we got there kind of in the late afternoon. Um, so we had a little bit of time to acclimate, um, but it wasn't quite the full 24 hours that would be ideal. Um, so tip number three is to um, drink a little bit more water than you usually do uh, leading up to the trip and then also once you're there. 
And um, some people will say, you know, you really got to like pound the water, drink as much water as you possibly can. Um, however, in my research, I've actually found that doctors discourage you from doing this because drinking too much water is also not a great thing. It may cause stress on your body in other ways if you're consuming more water than your body is used to handling. So um, you don't want to go overboard. <laughs> However, you do definitely want to up your liquid and your water intake. And um, try not to wait until you're there um, at the elevation, the high elevation destination. Ideally, you want to start maybe two days, maybe three days before you leave on your trip so that, you know, you are arriving already kind of extra hydrated because that's really going to help. Um, tip number four is um, there are a couple things that you want to avoid. Um, so you want to avoid alcohol and you also want to avoid salty foods. Um, and Basically, you know, minimizing your intake of both of those is going to help your body process things a little bit better. Um, also, you know, I won't say that we completely abstain from alcohol. We did have a glass of wine or two during our trip, but man, like you become a really cheap date <laughs> when you're at a high elevation because the alcohol hits you like in a totally different way. So even if you're not completely eliminating, eliminating alcohol, I think most likely you will naturally be consuming less anyway because it actually hits you a lot harder. Um, but you know, if you're not a big drinker anyway, great. Like if you can go without, that's definitely going to help you as well. Um, and then another thing, and this is always kind of a nice, uh, uh, a nice departure from the advice that we usually hear <laughs> is you actually want to eat more carbs. <laughs> so um, eating more carbs is going to give your body more energy to kind of like do all the things it needs to do to make up for this reduction in oxygen. So don't be afraid to carb up while you're there. Um, the funny thing is that um, altitude sickness, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, one of the symptoms is loss of appetite. And so um, I never have trouble eating, um, even like when I'm sick or depressed, it's like, I enjoy food. <laughs> so I was really surprised to see that when we were dealing with elevation sickness in Colorado, I had a very little appetite. And I was like, what is going on? Like, this is a very new feeling for me. But it's hard to explain. But it actually, honestly, it feels like the act of eating takes so much energy. Like it almost just feels like it's hard labor. Um, basically, a lot of things that you do feel like they take so much more energy than they usually do. Um, walking, like just walking from you know your hotel to the restaurant <clears throat> to the restaurant, it's like oh my god, this feels so hard to do this. And same thing with eating. It sounds really weird because eating just seems pretty effortless to us um, in our day to day lives. But I really found that I was like oh god, just the thought of like having to shovel more of this food into my mouth and chewing and swallowing. It's like, oh my God, so much work. <laughs> so um, if you can eat more carbs, um, but most likely if you're dealing with elevation sickness, uh, be aware that your appetite uh, will be greatly reduced. Um, so take it slow. Um, tip number six is use canned oxygen. Um, one thing that's great about visiting like a ski resort is that uh, they know how people feel. <laughs> so they're very used to having guests uh, with who are dealing with elevation sickness or who are not used to being at high altitudes or being out in the cold. So there's always um, the stores, whether it's like just regular grocery stores or um, ski rental supply stores, a lot of them are going to have a lot of uh, great kind of little tools and things, items that will help you feel more comfortable there. So things like hand warmers, foot warmers, um, those, those are basically like little packets that as soon as you open it and expose it to air, um, it has stuff inside. It's kind of like, um, it feels like it's like a little bag of sand or something. Um, and the ingredients inside activate and it gets warm. So if you put it in your pocket and you put your hands in your pocket, it's like, it feels really nice. So um, they have tons of stuff like that. And one of the items that really helps with elevation sickness is canned oxygen. So unfortunately I don't have a sample to show you, but if you just um, Google canned oxygen, you'll 
I'm sure you'll come across a lot of products or images of what I'm talking about. But it's basically like a metal canister and the, um, you know, you take the, the lid off and then inside it's kind of like an inhaler, like an asthma inhaler. And so you just like spray it into your mouth and you breathe in. Um, and it basically just gives you extra oxygen and, like, I don't know the science behind it. I don't know if it's scientifically legitimate, um, but whether it is truly doing something or whether it's just a placebo, this placebo effect, for us, we felt like it really made a big difference. So definitely stock up on that. Um, that's not something you need to bring with you. Like I said, they're going to carry it at like every single store you go to. Um, so definitely take advantage of it. You know, bring a can with you while you're skiing um, just so that, you know, you, if you feel a little out of breath when you're walking, um, take a couple pumps and it's really going to make a difference. Um, and then my last tip, tip number seven is, oh, actually, no, I do have a bonus tip after this. Okay. Tip number seven is overall, just try to take it easy. Um, this is when you're dealing with elevation sickness, it's not the time to go raw, raw, hundred percent charging forward, full energy. Um, let like, listen to your body. Um, your body is knows what it's doing. If it's telling you, it's showing you that it's tired, it's low on energy, go with that because, you know, physically there are things going on due to this shortage of oxygen that are legitimate. So you don't want to just like ignore all these symptoms and forge ahead. You want to really take it easy. So uh, like I mentioned, one of the things that causes caused us to be so out of breath and um, uh, made our hearts beat so fast was just walking. <laughs> Weirdly, the skiing itself was fine. Um, we didn't feel anything. In fact, we felt very comfortable. But it was like more of the when we were done with skiing and having to walk from wherever we ended up to the ski lift or to the gondola or walking to lunch. Um, those were the moments when we felt it the most. So take it easy. Don't run. Don't walk fast. Just relax and listen to your body. Um, otherwise, you don't want it to get worse. Um, I think most people will who get elevation sickness um, have some kind of like um, mild to severe symptoms for like the first 24 hours to 48 hours. And after that, it's fine. But you don't want to let it get to the point where you have to immediately go down to a low ele elevation and seek medical treatment um, because that's not a fun way to end your vacation. So definitely take it easy and listen to your body. Um, and then finally, kind of a bonus tip, um, if, if you're wondering, is there anything I can buy that will actually treat it? Is there medicine or some kind of treatment I can um, purchase? then um, apparently there are. So I haven't tried these. Um, I am also not a doctor. So, you know, obviously consult with your physician. Um, but there is a medicine called Diamox. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which you can get a prescription for. So that's something you can talk to your doctor about. Um, apparently it can reduce a person's chances for altitude sickness by 80 to 90%. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to eliminate it completely, but it may reduce your likelihood of getting it. Um, now, what I've heard is that if you um, go to the destination and you get altitude sickness and then you take the medicine, that's not going to help. Once you have it, there's nothing really that will make it go away. So this is more of a preventative thing. Um, so I believe you would take it sort of in anticipation of the trip. But again, obviously check with your physician. It's not something that I've tried, um, but you can ask your doctor about Diamox. Um, and then if you're looking for a more holistic treatment um, from my research, um, it seems like there's been a few research studies that have shown that ginkgo biloba, again, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, um, can help decrease the symptoms as well. So again, that might be something you want to talk to your doctor about. Again, I am not a medical professional, so definitely consult your physician. Um, but if you're looking for a more, more holistic treatment, there seems to be some evidence that that uh, particular um, supplement can help. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, so these are tips on dealing with and hopefully avoiding altitude sickness, or once you have it, kind of how to manage it. Um, it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, if you have, if it's going to be your first ski trip, uh, just like last year, that was our first ever family, uh, ski trip. Uh, there are, this may be something that you were not even <laughs> aware of. Um, it's not something that I had thought about. So, um, 
I definitely believe that the more information you have, the more prepared you're going to be and the better of an experience you're going to have. So hopefully you won't even need to deal with this at all. Oh, actually, one thing I should mention before I wrap here is um, kids can often experience uh, elevation sickness differently from adults. So for adults, it will often uh, kind of manifest in terms of shortness of breath, uh, a racing heart. With kids, they often feel it more kind of in their gastrointestinal region. So for kids, it often manifests more as like a stomach ache, or they're feeling nauseous, or just overall grumpy. Um, so if you are going on a ski trip and you feel that your kids are grumpier than usual, um, be patient with them because it is quite possible that it's actually, um, a symptom of elevation sickness that they're dealing with. Um, so just something to keep in mind. All right. Well, be sure to check out our blog at topflightfamily.com and subscribe to our channel for, um, all the great family travel videos and thank you for watching. Bye.